good afternoon and thanks for hanging in. I know it's a long day uh, that we have here um, and it's getting late in the afternoon, so we'll try and keep this entertaining. Uh, commercial space is nothing new. It's been going on um, from the earliest communication satellites. But what we're on the verge of now because of the infrastructure that's in place is that very soon there are going to be commercial enterprises, including humans, in low Earth orbit, potentially on the moon, uh, and potentially for applications we haven't thought of yet. So we would like to explore with the panel here today, and I'll introduce them all in just a second, um, what, what is different about human commercial space flight? What's necessary, what's critical? And how do we think about safety and risk in that environment um, while trying to have a, a viable business proposition? So I'm gonna go through and talk about each one of our, introduce each one of our panelists, and they have a short presentation they're gonna make. Um, first up, Dr. Mike Bain here on my left. Mike is uh, currently the uh, chief engineer at Axiom Space, which is focused on making living and working in orbit commonplace. Dr. Bain is, serves as a co-appointment as the chief of engineering at Intuitive Machines in Houston, as well as his role with Axiom. He spent 12 years at the Johnson Space Center where he held responsibilities for propulsion development for shuttle and station, led crew escape propulsion for OSP, was the Orion Propulsion System Manager and the Orion Principal Lead Engineer for Test and Verification. And he was the Chief Engineer for Morpheus that was just spoken about. Uh, Dr. Bain has a Mike Griffin-like list of degrees. He has, uh, uh, by my count, five. Uh, and uh, is starting with a, a BS in um, Electrical and Computer Engineering and a Bachelor's, Master's, and, and Doctorate in Physics from the University of San Diego. He, uh, his doctoral work was supervised by Dr. Sally Ride, <laughs> focused on the experimental in investigation of electron beam laser interactions, specifically the generation of laser synchrotron radiation. After graduation, he, uh, he had a postdoc with Franklin Chang Diaz and focused on electric propulsion for space. And in 2001, well, he, and so without further ado, Mike Bain. Thanks. And, you have some charts? Yeah, if we can cue up Mr. Bain's charts, please. I'll go ahead and stand up. I could I can mime them, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> you seem to be working. There are just a couple of charts to help uh, motivate some of the discussion that we're going to have. Um, so, our vision in Axiom Space is to is to make living and working in space commonplace. And so what are the things that you need to do to facilitate that? What are, what are the requirements, the stakeholder? There you go. There you go. And uh, is, it, oh, well, is it up? Yes. There we go. So what are the crew needs? So how, how do you make that a evolvable, a sustainable, um, a continuously uh, developing uh, enterprise? Um, so first, you kind of have to understand what, what the crew needs are. And so the first things that come to mind are, are air, water, or food, the, you know, the common th physiological, but really it needs to be more holistic. Um, there is a, a psychological theory of, of, uh, of human uh, uh, needs that was uh, developed by Maslow in the 1940s. And it's a, it's a useful construct to, to think about all the things you need to provide a crew, especially longer duration crews and when the crew numbers become larger and larger, what are the things that you have to design into your system in order to facilitate uh, uh, productiv productivity on, on orbit? Um, so it really, it starts with the, uh, the basic needs, the psychological, you know, the, the safety aspects of living and working. Uh, then there's the psychological needs. You still need that uh, connection to people and the earth uh, and then there is the uh, research and the, what, the, 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 at the pinnacle, the self-actualization, or basically feeling that you have a purpose and are able to meet, make meaningful contributions to the endeavor. Um, so a, a little bu bubble diagram there, you know, you, your basis, your, your infrastructure has to start off with uh, a fair amount of power uh, and heat rejection. Power is life in, in space. Um, and that's going to power everything that uh, is above there. Um, you need to, uh, 
to think about how you're going to uh, scrub the uh, atmosphere and provide water and recycling and waste management, uh, how you're preparing your food and your sleep and exercise, which are very important to the psychological needs. Um, and then you, you have to have a, that, that kind of umbrella of, uh, of, of safety, um, the training that's involved, the emergency systems, um, knowing that there's people on the ground that have your back and that are, are working to maintain the, the systems to be safe. Uh, Cruise escape is, is a big part of that too. So these are, these are things that, that go into that holistic uh, safety net uh, for, for crews. And, it's, and this really is no different for a government astronaut or a commercial astronaut. The needs are very much the same. How they're implemented may be a little bit different and we, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a much broader, broader stroke of things that we need to, to make sure that we have to uh, make living and working in space commonplace. Now, some of the things, oh, the color can come through. Some of the things that uh, you, you need to do, if we're, we're looking at just uh, uh, what differentiates between uh, a commercial enterprise and a government enterprise, is there's a bigger sensitivity to cost, both acquisition cost as well as life cycle cost. And so when you look at what does it take to, to fit the consumables that are needed to, to uh, keep that crew alive, um, about the, the daily consumption of a crew member is about half of it is just water. So there's a, there's a large logistic supply of water that needs to happen. And you know, some of the things that, that NASA has done over the years is to help recycle that water. And I'll show some charts coming up. Um, and then, the, so about 50% water, about a third of it is food. Uh, just the nutritional uh, food needed. That, that doesn't really take into account if you have other dietary <laughs> needs or if you're trying to provide a, a more of an experience uh, for crew members. Uh, it's kind of a, it's a, an ISS-based number. Uh, and then the rest are about a little less than a quarter are you know, personal items, clothing, hygiene, uh, things for the ecosystem that, other oh, color just came in, great. Um, that uh, things like uh, wipes and uh, the, the, the potty maintenance uh, filters, things like that, just the, the consumption of ecos materials in order to, uh, to keep those systems running. Uh, and then a little bit of crew preference there. Um, so that is kind of the, the recurring logistics that you need to consider for keeping a crew member on orbit. So when we look at cost, um, closing the loop is pretty important. It's, NASA's realized this in, in, from a deep space perspective that the, the gear factors are so intense that the more you can recycle, uh, the better off you're gonna be. Um, this is also true for commercial. Um, there is a, a logistics cost of launching stuff from the Earth. Um, and so what we have here is a couple different uh, lines here for a, a single four person or eight person. We just look at the uh, four person. This is uh, four, four people on orbit for a year. And you look at the basic, whoops, let me go back. Can I go back? There we go. Um, you see if, if you don't close the loop, if you're gonna throw away basically all your water, uh, you're launching quite a bit of, you know, 15 metric tons of water to keep those four crew members um, living uh, in, in space. If you are able to recover the condensate and, and repurpose that, you can see there's a benefit there. If you can recycle the urine, you get another benefit. And you kind of get this tapering, diminishing returns of how hard do you want to work to close that loop. And then at the, at the very end, you basically, if you were able to get 100% uh, water recovery, you still have to worry about the food and clothing and those other items. So when you look at it, it holistically of all the, all the mass that you need to provide for crew members, there's lots of areas where you'd like to poke on and try to get those numbers or be able to recycle materials uh, to help that, those numbers. And if you just consider the cost of cargo resupply, which is highly variable, but let's just assume that it's uh, about $40,000 a kilogram. You, you could be spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year just in those consumables. And this is not even utilization. This is just the basic needs of people staying there. All right. 
All right, thank you, Mike. Uh, next up is Robert Richter. Uh, Robert's the Director of Environmental Systems at Sierra Nevada Corporation. He's been in the business for over 26 years since his graduation from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. His expertise revolves around humans in space, um, from the research hardware that they use to the conditions in which they live. Prior, prior experiences include flight systems development for NASA as well as commercial cargo and, and crew related efforts. One system Mr. Richter recently managed was the veggie plant growth system, which has been providing the crew of space station with fresh food and has become so popular, NASA has recently installed a second unit. So Robert? Thank you. Uh, so I'm Robert Richter with Sierra Nevada Corporation, and I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of SNC this afternoon. If you have any questions, please find me later and I'll try to answer those questions. Uh, SNC has been around, it's based on a 51-year-old business, uh, and through its innovation has really demonstrated uh, significant growth uh, over the last couple of years. One of the business areas within Sierra Nevada is its space systems group. The space systems group has over 26 years of flight uh, heritage and is comprised of about 500 employees in total and that number is increasing. Uh, the Space System Group is actually broken into four business units of which uh, I'm part of the Environmental Systems in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, it was formerly known as Orbitech. Uh, three and a half years ago, SNC purchased Orbitech and as of this year, we've been fully integrated with SNC. Uh, and it's really a, given us the reach back to more resources and capital that as a small business really was limiting our growth and, and right now we feel that we really have access to that and increase our opportunities. Some of the more popular uh, missions and products associated with the Space Systems Group obviously are the commercial cargo, science missions, crew, as well as the extended duration habitat someday hopefully. Uh, and we mentioned Veggie earlier as a personal interest, it's a program I was involved with. And what gave me a lot of pride here is the feedback I received from the crew. Every crew member I talked to that used Veggie said it was their favorite payload. Uh, and really we hope to gain experience here so that someday Mark Watney has a much easier and simpler time growing food <laughs> for himself. And this picture I just had to throw in because I find it inspiring. Uh, you know, here I think Dream Chaser really lives up to its name. So, thank you. All right, next up is Darren Samplatsky. Darren's the Director of Business Development and Programs at UTC Aerospace Systems in Windsor Locks, Connecticut. He's been involved in developing life support systems for more than 20 years. During this time, he's worked on the development of several key life support systems for the International Space Station, including the Sabati A system he's the program manager for, and most recently, he's the program manager for the thermal system components on the Parker Solar Probe. Uh, he is, um, these systems are the systems that people have been talking about, that Mike was talking about, uh, for oxygen generation, water production, thermal control, and, and, and cleaning up the air and cleaning up the water. Uh, he currently manages a portfolio of programs focused on the development of uh, developed systems needed for deep space exploration, which includes um, our participation in the NASA Next Step program. So Darren, I'll right. turn it over to you. Thank you, Bill. Um, so. Uh, I guess I have a short video. I, I think I'll show it after I do my talk. I don't have slides like these guys, so um, you'll have to bear with a, a, a video on, on life support equipment. So probably not the most exciting video, but uh, it's certainly not as exciting as the, the video in the last session, right? Uh, um, but uh, you know, life support's one of those things that, uh, that, that we really need. We really need to focus on it. Uh, at UTC uh, Aerospace, uh, we have more than 50 years of uh, of experience uh, working on, on life support systems, uh, supporting uh, mostly NASA back then, and uh, as we as we move into this uh, more commercial uh, sp space market, um, you know we're we're su supporting a lot more of the the, uh, the commercial uh, endeavors that are out there. Uh, we did so, um, provide a majority of the hardware uh, for the International Space Station. I think Mike talked a little bit about how uh, you know really it's important to close the loop on the International Space Station right now. We we close that loop uh, for resupply up to about 85% uh, with a lot of our systems uh, that are up there. Uh, some of those systems that uh, Bill talked about, the oxygen generator, uh, the water processor, uh, we do uh, the ammonia pumps, uh, we do a lot of the filters and fans on, on the International Space Station. Uh, we also do uh, the uh, common cabin air assembly, 
uh, where I think Mike was talking about how uh, you know we need to pull uh, the condensate out of the air. So that assembly pulls the condensate out of the air, puts that back into the water processor, and then we then we reprocess that water um, and goes back in, into the system. Uh, we're, we also uh, supply a, a, a variety of uh, hardware for the Orion vehicle. Uh, mo mo more of the Orion is more of an open loop system uh, because it's a shorter mission. Uh, you don't need to have that, that fully closed loop system like we do on the International Space Station. Uh, for there, we, we do uh, everything from the uh, commode, the toilet, uh, to the uh, thermal control. Uh, uh, we do the power management and distribution uh, on that vehicle as well as the air re uh, revitalization. Uh, and then uh, as we get uh, into more of the commercial markets, uh, we do a lot of work uh, with, with Boeing on the uh, CST-100 and uh, uh, Sierra Nevada on the, uh, on the uh, cargo and uh, Dream Chaser uh, programs. Um, and, and those systems are even one more step down as far as open loop. So, so because they're much shorter missions, you know, you can bring up things like bottled gas. You don't need an oxygen generator or a water processor. So, so those, those vehicles, uh, uh, you know, they, they basically take a lot of the basic stuff, but uh, they all kind of evolve. And then uh, also doing a support of the uh, NASA Next Step program. That's our, our, our next uh, uh, program that, uh, you know, we're really looking to the future. Uh, a lot of these guys are uh, on those teams. Uh, we're working directly with NASA developing a uh, universal pallet design uh, that uh, hopefully will be able to be used in any vehicle. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really being designed for the life support equipment. Uh, we're working on the uh, standards and um, uh, interfaces uh, for those systems uh, directly through NASA. So as uh, Bill Gerstemeyer talked about this morning, you know, we really want a standard so that uh, you know, if, if you know, Boeing or Sierra Nevada has a, a better you know, CO2 removal system, they can pop whatever's in, in there out and put, put that next one in there and uh, really give us that ability to, uh, to, to, to go deep space. And uh, on our next step program, we're also looking at uh, you know trying to make the hardware more serviceable and uh, maintainable. Uh, I, one of the biggest complaints on the space station was, you know, you develop these things called ORUs, orbital replacement units, that are big and heavy. And uh, every time you know just something goes wrong, you have a, a valve or something stick. You know, you're bringing home 300 pounds of equipment when you could have probably just replaced the uh, one and a half pound uh, you know valve. So. Uh, Really looking forward to that program. I think I got a short video that uh, we're going to show. I think they said the uh, audio wasn't working, so what was kind of a uh, not the most exciting video to start with is probably even less exciting with no audio. <laughs> but uh, okay. uh, take a look. Thank you. I'd sing, but. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> About that. So. Uh, not to shortchange the video, I'm quite proud of it actually, but um, I would do, do want to introduce John Elbone so we can conserve time here. Um, John doesn't need an introduction. Uh, he's currently Boeing's Director of Global Sales and Marketing for NASA programs. In this role, he leads the integration of Boeing's human space flight programs, including the ISS, Space Launch System, Commercial Crew, and Next Step programs. He also leads Boeing Human Space Flight Strategic Council and is an industry advisor to the Coalition for Deep Space Exploration. He's also a good friend and a great guy to partner with. Seems like John and I have worked together <clears throat> from planning space station assembly sequences way back forever ago to processing payloads at the Kennedy Space Center uh, to building uh, the first elements of the International Space Station together. <clears throat> so John, I'll, uh, I'll let you start whenever you're ready. Okay, thanks Bill. We have had a chance to do a lot of cool stuff together. Yeah. Yeah, if, if you um, happen to be living on Space Station, that video of how the um, systems keep you alive is very exciting. <laughs> Those guys. Hey, um, Pat, thanks for inviting me to be a part of this. The um, conference is off to a good start. There's a kind of a circuit of conferences that happen through the year, and if you've been in this business a while, you end up going. I always really look forward to coming to this one. And um, it's, uh, I think Sandy Magnus is here, so I will say yours and Sandy's are my favorites. <laughs> They're all good. Okay. Hey, um, I wanted to I, I come at this a little different angle. I wanted to take a couple of, uh, make a couple of points about how cruise systems might be the same or might be different um, in commercial programs as opposed to, or in comparison to, I suppose, to NASA-led programs that we're used to, like shuttle and station, and before that, Apollo and et cetera. Um, so the first slide, I guess I'm doing the first slide. There we go. Um, so this is a commercial um, aerospace vehicle. It's um, 
a 787, people probably recognize that. Um, but I can tell you that um, the standards for safety and reliability for what I would say is truly a commercial vehicle shown there are at least as stringent as anything that we do for human spaceflight programs. And it's, it's driven by um, the, the realities of being in business. If, if um, you know, each of us, or at least most of us, got on a plane and came to this conference and didn't even think about, you know, are we going to get there? Is it going to be safe? Is it going to be reliable? Um, even if it wasn't a Boeing plane, you probably didn't think that. Um, so, you know, as, as space flight matures, that same kind of safety and reliability is going to be very necessary if you're going to run a business and be successful um, financially. So I think, um, particularly over the long haul, the business dynamics will will force safety and reliability into commercial vehicles in the same way it's, it's, um, it's present in programs like shuttle and station. And, and so I, th I think that's a, a thing that will happen as we go. You know, the FAA monitors what we do on commercial airplanes, but, but frankly, um, if they even weren't there, we would put just as much into those. And humans, as we've talked about flying private spaceflight participants on commercial vehicles, it seems that those people aren't the same kind of people that would climb Mount Everest because only two out of three people come back. They actually are, um, in general, successful business people who want to go up and come back safely. And so it's, a, it's just a natural force that's in the environment. So all the things that cause us to be very diligent about reliability and safety are also true as we're looking at Starliner. You know, we're following the same rigorous processes for building the vehicle, for testing the vehicle, for training the crew uh, that we would for commercial airplanes, that we would for commercial satellites, um, that we did for shuttle and for station. And so I, I'm, I'm not sure where the um, ideas come from that you hear once in a while about how commercial space flight wouldn't be as safe if we, um, if we don't regulate. I think, at least over the long haul, it'll be very um, self-regulating. So what about the crew systems, though, that are in commercial vehicles? Um, Starliner is an autonomous system. It, it can function as a cargo vessel without crew. Um, but the third leg of redundancy, in some cases, for crew is human in the loop. So it has to have really robust crew interface systems. An example is there's a line of switches on the panel that you can flip starting with the top one and going all the way down that deploy the parachutes, the drogue chutes and the parachutes in sequence and you do those at the right time. So if the, if the autonomous system isn't working, the crew can um, still return safely. So those kind of interfaces um, are important as we go forward. Um, I think if there is a difference in what we can do for commercial vehicles is that we can really focus on the requirements and build a vehicle that only meets those requirements. I can tell you when we start on Starliner, the first thing I wrote across the top of the whiteboard was, we are only going to LEO. And so there are no, re no requirements, nothing got into that vehicle that was providing the capability beyond a very short duration mission to LEO. And in that way, the, the cost was controlled to some degree, at least, and, and, the, um, and the mission was focused. I can tell you from the experience I've had when we work on NASA programs, um, like shuttle or station, it's not as easy to have that kind of a um, hard requirement to focus on the business model and on cost. And because we're developing new technologies on those programs, we want to try new things. And sometimes things happen in those vehicles because they're cool and, and we want to do them that way. And there's much more of a filter for that kind of stuff when we're looking at commercial vehicles. So some examples, these are the spacesuits from the shuttle and spacesuits from um, the one that um, is going to be used on Starliner. Um, the, one, the, the suit for Starliner is really focused on just um, keeping the crew alive during ascent and during entry. Um, we were able to do some new things because things have evolved, like the hard boots that you see in the shuttle suit are replaced more with like um, CrossFit kind of tennis shoes almost. It's kind of cool. The gloves are much more tactile and they can operate touch pads and the helmet isn't as rigid and heavy, et cetera. So kind of streamline that a bit. Um, we're only a short mission, so we don't need a galley. That's a picture of the galley from shuttle. Didn't need to put a galley in Starliner. It's a short mission, so the crew's going to eat out of bags. You know, not a lot of preparation. So that saves 
saves money in development time, etc. Here's a, um, a potty from the shuttle. You know, it's a, a couple week mission, so you got to have a potty. And, and here's the potty on Starliner. You know, it's much simpler and, <laughs> and, and um, doesn't drive the cost. So, you know, things like that we can do. That doesn't affect safety. It doesn't reflect reliability. I don't know, the crew may beg to differ a little bit. Um, but, but it reduces cost because we're just focused on the short mission. So um, that's all I, I had there, Bill. I can say that I think this is just really exciting times, the things that we're going through, all the presentations that you heard today, and, uh, and we're just excited to be a part of it. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, uh, gentlemen. As you, as you can tell from these presentations, there's a diversity of approaches um, to the different missions that people are trying to satisfy. Um, Axiom is looking at a low Earth orbit space station um, in Starliner and Dream Chaser are both uh, uh, vehicles with short duration missions. Uh, and so the solutions to those are different and there's different levels. And you can see the, the difference in how you tailor your requirements in your development to match what you're trying to do. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, but going to the next step in humans, um, commercial human space flight. You know, one is the sortie mission that John and, and Robert can talk about. The other is uh, um, a long duration mission. And Mike already hinted that um, logistics is going to be uh, a real challenge uh, in their business model. And so I was going to ask, start with Mike, but then ask Darren and others to talk about, you know, what are the key technologies and systems that are going to have to be developed um, specifically for a commercial application for humans to be on orbit? Um, so I, I guess I would start by, there's, I wouldn't say there's a huge gulf between uh, what NASA is trying to do and what commercially um, is, is needed to bring that cost down. Um, I think where, where the differences are is kind of in the acquisition strategy and, and how those systems are, are developed, um, whether uh, it under, under, you know, I was 12 years in the government, uh, there's a lot of oversight and cost that goes into making sure that those systems can't fail. On the commercial side, um, you want reliability, you want maintainability, uh, and you are looking for other opportunities to make sure that the systems that you have are safe and that you have basically either dissimilar redundancy or a, a, a something that's gonna backstop you so that if those systems do fail, that you, you are not gonna jeopardize the crew. It may become uncomfortable for a little bit, but you always have the opportunity to bring them home. So you have a layered approach to how you keep that crew safe. Um, and so you can take a little bit more risk in how you develop that system because you, don't, you can allow a certain amount of failure and not risk the, uh, the life of the crew. So Darren is a provider of, of one of the critical systems, the life support system. Um, what do you think? Yes, I mean, I think, you know, as commercial crew and cargo, you know, goes out there, you know, it's getting, it'll get cheaper to, uh, to, to do those resupply missions. And also, you know, some of those critical technologies that I think we, we're starting to look at now and it's, it's, it's becoming a lot more, uh, you know, in the mainstream is, is you know, things like additive manufacturing, um, you know, I think that'll eventually revolutionize, uh, you know, our supply chain, right? So instead of bringing up every part you need and, you know, two backups for it, you'll be able to just bring up, you know, some critical spare parts and then, you know, basically make everything else you need uh, on orbit. So I think, you know, that's one of those technologies that going uh, in the future is really going to help. Uh, you know, the other thing is, uh, I think Mike was talking about is, the systems are getting more reliable, right? I think we have, you know, 50 plus years of space history now. Um, and I think, you know, we know how to build hardware better now. We've learned an awful lot on the International Space Station. You know, we have over 15 years of uh, experience on the space station and, you know, flowing those lessons learned into the hardware, uh, you know, really makes them more reliable. So, I, I, you know, I think, it's, it's not going to be such a big problem, you know, going in the future. Robert, any thoughts? Uh, I'd agree with Darren that uh, in-space manufacturing is going to be key because if you can bring some raw material and make parts as needed and not have to fly another mission because then you're saving the transportation costs and, and that's where a bulk of the expense is. Yeah, I would just add, Bill, you, you mentioned the cost of logistics. If you look at space station, um, the, the budget, NASA's budget for stations, three billion years, more than half of that is just for resupply of crew and cargo. So for a commercial to um, 
flourish in low Earth orbit, the costs of launching crew and launching cargo have to come down. And uh, it's a real chicken and egg thing. The more often we fly, the lower the cost gets. The lower the cost gets, I suppose, the more often we would fly. So getting that whole thing started is, is going to be important going forward. All right. Um, so John, when you were talking, you talked a little bit about the differences you're taking in development um, for um, Starliner um, from what was done in the past, because either a different set of requirements allow you to do something differently, um, or you're choosing to do it you know, for other reasons. Um, but I was going to ask the panel members to talk a little bit about what they see as the differences in both development of systems for commercial space flight with humans in them, as well as operations. Um, because we talked, in, in presentations, we've talked a good amount about what the uh, uh, design trade-offs can be. But let's talk a little bit about how we see operations happening. Um, Mike? Start with me again? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's definitely an operational learning curve, and there is a, a lot of valuable lessons uh, that have come out of uh, Space Station. And uh, those are, those are, that's a gold mine that you want to go look at. Um, and, and I agree that we've, based on that learning, you, we can develop um, more reliable, more robust systems. Um, and then from an operational standpoint of in space, being able to service them at a lower level of uh, ORU uh, is going to be important. Um, instead of flying back big ORUs and reflying a refurbishment unit. Um, and then on the ground side, there's a lot of, uh, of lessons learned from operating space station from the ground. Um, going to smaller and smaller teams of people, um, but it's still having the same sort of insight and control. Uh, then there's a whole bunch of automation of software that is, looks like it's, it's going to help that situation even more. So I think from an operational uh, cost of running this station, uh, any station, um, I think that's only going to get better in the future. Robert, any thoughts? I think developmentally, uh, a lot of the requirements we look at, we look at value added. And when it comes to safety, a lot of those requirements are, are necessary because without safety, you really don't have a, a good commercial case. Um, however, as new technologies come along, uh, some of those requirements may change. So we always are evaluating our requirements to make sure that they're value added. I think that's key. Anybody at the far end down there? Um, I'd, I'd just throw in, out a, uh, throw in a few examples, Bill, of how a, a real thing that we um, leveraged as we looked at operations for Starliner was using existing capabilities. So, for example, the launch vehicle is the Atlas V, and it launches independently of Starliner several times a year. The same launch team will launch it. Um, we, we contracted with the um, Flight Operations Directorate at JSC to do the mission ops so that those guys who do mission, plan, train, fly for other things are also going to do it for Starliner, and, and so they, they don't have to be a, a dedicated resource for that. And importantly, we co-located our whole team in Florida so that the engineers that are doing support to manufacturing, um, sustaining from a design pers perspective, can also be the back room for the flight ops, and we don't have to have dedicated cadres for all those functions. So that's something we've, we've leveraged, I think, um, to reduce the ops cost. So uh, several of the presentations touched on this before, but I'd like to spend a couple more minutes um, and have the panel um, interact on this, is uh, um, how, should we, um, how should we treat risk management um, in a commercial space flight arrangement, a commercial human space flight arrangement? I mean, John's already said that it really doesn't make sense to, to treat it any differently, but uh, um, just get the other panel members to, to chime in on that one. Yeah, Aaron? I think yes. risk management's uh, obviously very important, right? I, I mean, it's, yeah, it's probably one of the most important things we do, right? Every, every product we build, we want to make sure that we, we drive the risk out. I, I, I don't know if we necessarily do it different than we do for, you know, some of our, our, our government uh, contracts, but, uh, I mean, there, there may be some more flexibility with the commercial market, but, I mean, it's still a, a critical event that you have to do. Yeah, I guess, Bill, I would add to what I said before that I think especially early on it's important for, um, and this will happen, NASA will be involved in the flight readiness review process um, just like they were for shuttle when that program was up and running. And that's important. I think the roles will be a little different. Um, but having that second set of eyes uh, asking probing questions is, um, is important to make sure we're, 
we're doing things. Or we aren't overlooking anything. Anybody that's ever survived a Bill Gerstemeyer probing of their, <laughs> of their uh, flight readiness knows that, that well, that's a very thorough and, um, and um, valuable process. So uh, we're going to do one more question up here, and then we'll transition um, to the questions from the audience. Uh, the last question, um, well, two, two questions. Um, one is, you know, what do we see as the technologies and systems that are the biggest risk items um, for long, long duration human spaceflight, commercially, commercial human spaceflight? Robert, Darren, I mean? I think the biggest risk technology that, that I see is uh, propulsion, launch, and transit, really those technologies associated with it those represent the greatest risk to success. Yeah, I mean, I, I, as far as the life support technologies, I, I, you know, I mean, they're, they're all equally critical, right? I need water, I need oxygen, I need CO2 removal, I need, you know, thermal control. So I don't, I don't know if I'd put one over the other. I mean, the, the, the one we, you know, that's the most critical or time sensitive is, is, is um, CO2 removal. I think that's the biggest thing we deal with on space station is, you know, if that system goes down for, you know, more than a couple of hours, you know, you, you start to panic. So, I mean, that's probably the one technology that, that you know, you've got to make sure you have at least one, one or two backups for, uh, uh, no matter what you do. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. The, the CO2 scrubbing, uh, even though that it's been done forever on, on shuttle and station, uh, because the new technologies that are coming along have less uh, shelf life, I think there's probably more development risk there. Uh, the other systems are, are very uh, minor uh, evolutions of the current systems. Um, so from a development standpoint, I think, yeah, the CO2 system is probably uh, where the risk is. Yeah, I would say, uh, well, first of all, my media, media training bill tells me never to get trapped into picking one by the person <laughs> asking questions. So I'll pick two. I, I, and I agree with what, what you guys say. I think launch, and re-entry systems are very important because that's just a critical time of, of the flight and as all the dynamic stuff's going on, and that's when we've had problems in the past. <clears throat> and the environmental control life support system has proven to be the most challenging thing on space station. You know, we've been um, tinkering with the, um, what we call the CEDRA system, which you guys talked about, carbon dioxide removal, since it got up there and still don't have it totally reliable. So doing work to make sure those systems are um, reliable and functioning and they behave differently on orbit than they do on the ground. So it's important we develop new systems and are able to test them on station and then later at the Deep Space Gateway before we take off from Mars to make sure they're working. All right, uh, to wrap up this part of it, I'd just like to ask each of the panel members to take a minute or so and give us your thoughts on what the uh, human spaceflight community will look like by the time we get to 2030. So uh, let's start with Darren. Um, I, I, I think it'll look, uh, you know, similar to what we have today, but, uh, you know, I think it'll be more of a, a commercial approach, right? It'll be, it'll be similar to how, you know, the airline industry evolved. And uh, hopefully by, you know, the 2030s, uh, we're getting ready to make missions to uh, Mars and that, uh, you know, the uh, commercial space market in low Earth orbit uh, is a, uh, a thriving uh, industry, uh, much like we have today with the airline industry. All right, uh, Robert? Well, I think as the commercial industry starts taking more of a foothold, uh, we'll see faster cycle times than what the government's able to do. And hopefully, much like with satellites, we'll start to see a rapid acceleration of commercial flights. Uh, so that, that's where we hope it goes. Mike, I, I think you have some ideas. Yeah, so, uh, you know, from an axiom perspective, um, uh, we really see, you know, that the stepping stone approach of starting, you know, with a, a small couple, couple of modules at ISS and then growing that, leaving ISS into a, its own fully functioning station and then growing that into an industrial park. Um, so by 2030, I would imagine that we would have close to 100 people on orbit and probably growing the, the number of people on orbit about 50% a year through, through that whole time period. And John? Back yeah, so up. I think um, in, in, you know, in 2030, um, NASA's real focus will be on the Deep Space Gateway and starting journeys from there out into space. And they will, will, um, will have continued to um, foster and, and, um, and bolster the commercial market in low Earth orbit. I think, you know, I, I think station will still be here in 2030. I'll, I'll predict that. Um, I think we'll be talking seriously about the end of its lifetime um, by 2030. 
and there will be um, commercial um, stations um, like Axiom or, or Bigelow that, that are um, starting up. But I think the, the important thing to all that getting going is having some revenue. And I think in 2030, the revenue will still be predominantly sovereign entities that are buying time on, on whatever stations are there. And the real thing that will set all this off is when we find revenue outside of government that, that can only be done in low Earth orbit. Um, beyond tourism, that's a kind of a niche little thing, and that's not really going to create a, a huge economy, at least initially, in my opinion. Um, but we get some real manufacturing and stuff that can happen in low Earth orbit, then, then it will take off. So if, if that happens, then my um, predictions are all wrong, and we'll have thousands of people living in space doing stuff by 2030. <laughs> so we'll see. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, so we're going to go through a couple of questions now from the audience. Uh, so for John, this one's directed at you. Uh, at what point do you think that Boeing will be looking to add a fifth paid seat to the four-person uh, NASA ISS commercial crew vehicle? Yesterday. <laughs> so, you know, we've, since when, when NASA put out the, the um, RFP for um, commercial crew, it allowed uh, that kind of a, an approach. And so we've been working um, for many years with the idea of cultivating or, or working that. And, and we have folks that are talking to, there's a lot of interest in, you know, the number of seats are kind of limited and there's a lot of interest in them. So, so we started working on it a long time ago. When we will have a um, inked deal that says, here's a person that's gonna fly, um, I can't predict. I think that's within some small number of, of years, maybe months, I don't know. But. All right. Um, the next question is, um, why don't we start, uh, Darren, you already touched on it. We'll start, we'll let you come back and, and take your shot at it and then maybe go to Robert. Uh, what role do you see for 3D printed replacement parts instead of carrying spare parts on long missions? Yeah, I mean, I think it's gonna be critical for deep space exploration. I think, I think you know, their, uh, NASA just came out with their Fab Lab uh, NRA, so that, that's uh, under the Next Step programs as well. Um, where they're, they're trying to develop that next set of, of uh, in-space manufacturing uh, capabilities. And, uh, you know, I think that that market is, is just really taken off. I, I know from a uh, United Technologies standpoint, we've, you know, invested, you know, tens of millions of dollars, if not more, into, uh, into those, those technologies. And, and, you know, our research center uh, has, has invested hundreds of millions of dollars into that, you know. So I think eventually, you know, you're going to be making almost all of your parts um, you know, anything from metal or plastic or combinations of, of both. You know, they're looking at uh, being able to print um, complete uh, circuit boards now, uh, you know, using 3D printers. So I, I think it's, it's, it's really going to take off. And I mean, there, there's even talk of uh, companies out there that can, can manufacture food. So, um, you know, you may be printing your pizza someday. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll go to um, uh, first to Robert on this one. What are some of the key challenges you feel are ripe for technology innovation that support water and air quality needs for crew support? I think some of the key technologies uh, would be uh, water removal from the, the air. Uh, current systems right now have to be dried out for eight hours at a time to try to remove microbial growth. We have a problem with some trace contaminants in the precip. Um, so that, that's an area I think that definitely could use some improvement. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, I know NASA is actually off working on, you know, looking at different coatings and stuff for condensing heat exchangers. So, I, you know, they've, they've been trying to address some of the issues we've seen on space station. And, uh, you know, hopefully in the next uh, three or four years, we'll, you know, have a, another solution. And actually, yeah, we're flying a, a tech demo here, hopefully within a year uh, to address that. So. Right. Uh, another question, is this panel's lesson that supporting human health will be a major obstacle to the expansion of commercial space? Um, Mike, you want to take a shot first? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I, I think it's just going to add to the, uh, the data that we are currently collecting. Um, we, we fully expect that it will be flight docks that, that follow uh, uh, the <laughs> commercial crews, um, and that data will be part of the, the overall data set of, of living in space. All right. Well, uh, since this is the most frequently asked question, 10 people have asked it, so we'll, we'll get to it, even though it's a little bit far afield for this panel, is what do, do you consider to be the smallest practical crew size to go to Mars and return? And what would be the proper gender makeup? Anybody want to take that one on? 
That is really far afield. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to have to pass on that one and get some. I was going to say at yeah. least two. At least two. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to pass on that and get somebody who's um, more uh, uh, versed in that. I mean, you know, most of the stuff that NASA's looking at right now is, is, you know, in sets of four. So, you know, they would potentially either send four or eight people. But, I, you know, I'd, I don't have any expertise in that area. But And hopefully that's something, you know, this next step effort will help us prove and demonstrate, maybe help guide, uh, you know, as we start doing some cislunar orbits. And then I think we'll, we'll close on, on this one. Uh, um, you know, what is the potential for separating oxygen from CO2? Darren, why don't you uh, take that one on? What is the potential? I mean, yeah. you know, it, it's certainly possible. I mean, we, you know, there, there's a lot of ways to, to split water, so, uh, or CO2. Uh, yeah, I don't have any, you know, systems I'm working on right now that do that, but, but there's certainly electrolysis uh, systems that can do that. Robert, I don't know if you, you may have. Uh, yeah, we've worked on methanation reactors right. and things like that, some body A type processes. So CO2, you know, breaking it down into oxygen, methane, uh, those type of systems are achievable today. Right. All right. Um, why don't we go ahead and wrap this up? Um, it might be a little bit early here, Wayne. But, but well, we thank you because our next stop is a break. I did have an answer to the Mars question, not part A, because I don't know how many, but part B, the gender question. I propose all women. In my experience, they're more cooperative. They take less oxygen, less water, and less <laughs> logistics overall. So that would be my proposal. And on that note, I want to thank the panel. Thank you. It's time for our afternoon break, sponsored by the Truck Farm, a local New Mexico chili and condiment company. We'll reconvene at 4 o'clock, and let's show our thanks to the panel one more time.